and we are live everyone so my name is jesse and i am with exploring by the seat of your pants for those joining us for the first time we are all about bringing conservation adventure and science into classrooms around the world and of course there are no classrooms right now all of you guys are stuck at home just like we are so we really appreciate you continuing to tune in on youtube as we highlight amazing scientists facilities and explorers from around the globe Today, we are continuing a series we began before all this happened with Glacier National Park, one of the most beautiful places in the entire world in Northern Montana, just on the border with Canada there. And so we're joined by Stephanie and she is a ranger there and she's gonna explain a little bit about what makes the park so spectacular uh, and her own experiences there. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today, Stephanie, and take it away. Well, hello everyone. I'm so excited to talk to you all about some of the things that make Glacier National Park such a special place. And I'll just dive right in, I'll get my PowerPoint up so everyone can see it. And as Glacier National Park, we are part of the Greater National Park Service. So if anyone has been to any, any of the United States National Parks, they've probably seen this symbol right here. And the symbol basically helps remind everyone who comes to these places of what we work to protect. And a lot of it is natural features of our environment, but we also protect a lot of the cultural and historic features of the environment. So today we're gonna to be talking a lot about the natural elements of Glacier, as well as some of the cultural elements of Glacier that make it such a special place and make it a place that we wanted to protect long, long ago. So before we get started, though, it's important to point out where exactly is Glacier National Park. So Glacier National Park is located in very far northwestern Montana. So if you locate that red star right over here in that corner of Montana, we are located very far north in the country, really right across that Canadian border. And we're going to actually talk a little bit more about the connection that we have with Canada as Glacier National Park. And if I were to be in the office today, and if normally if I leave the office, this is the view that I'm greeted with daily. So this is a picture of the largest lake here in Glacier National Park. This is Lake McDonald. It is about 10 miles long, about a mile wide, and it has these grand mountain views behind it. And that's just one of the many special things that make Glacier such an incredible place. But we have so many other things that also make this a really special place to explore. So we're just going to dive right into those different things. And we're going to start off talking about some of our wildlife that call this place home. So here in the park, we have a variety of different habitats. That photo we just looked at was a photo of one of our many lake or stream habitats in the park, a habitat that's really important for lots of different wildlife, things like fish, ducks, as well as moose. We do have a large population of moose in the park and our moose are really tied to our waterways because they like a lot of vegetation that lives near the waterways and they're really built for waterways. They're built, they're built with really, really long thin legs so they can walk really well in water. If we were to move further across the park, move on to the eastern edge of Glacier National Park, we tend to have lots of big open grasslands or prairies on the eastern edge of our park. And these big open grasslands and prairies have lots of really good grasses and wildflowers that are great for a variety of animals. Things like bears could be found here. Probably one of the more common animals though that we find in these prairies is gonna be things like a common white-tailed deer. We also have mule deer. And then other of different animals are across the park. And here at Glacier, we're really left bears in the don't see in many parts of the with grizzlies and black bears. For grizzlies, the common people come to visit Glacier National Park is what bear did I see? It's very difficult for people to figure out, did I see a grizzly bear or did I see a black bear? So there's some key features to look for on our bears to figure out the difference between them. If you look at these two photos here, you can notice on the bears, look for the highest point on their body. For a grizzly bear, the highest point of their body is going to be what we call a shoulder hump. It's this big muscle mass between their shoulder blades. For our black bears, the highest point of their body is going to be their rump, so they don't have that shoulder hump. Other things you can look for if you see these a bear in the park would be their ears. So for grizzly bears, they're going to have short, rounded ears. Our black bears are going to have much taller, more pointed ears. And then of course their faces are a little bit different. So our grizzly bear has a much more kind of dished in, almost squished like face. While our black bear has a much longer profile, kind of like a dog if you all have a dog. And then if you notice on this map right here, this will actually show you where grizzly bears live, 
where polar bears live, where black bears live. So you can see where these bears are living in North America. So what makes Glacier so unique is that we are in one of those small crossover areas where we have both grizzly bear and black bear populations. So if you look at this darker brown color, we're located right around this area here. So we are right in that chunk that has both black bear and grizzly bear populations. You'll also see that there's an area that's right around Yellowstone, also in low, the lower 48 that has both of these populations and then a very, very small area in Washington state. So not many places in the lower 48 have these both types of bears for a chance to see. So that's really one huge reason why Glacier is protected and why it's a really unique place. And then as we move a little bit further up in habitats in the park, we start to get into our mountainous habitats. Here at Glacier, we are so lucky and blessed with so many mountains surrounding the park inside of the park. And in these mountainous habitats is where a lot of really unique animals call home. So things like our mountain goats love to live in these mountainous habitats. And why the mountain goats love these mountains has to do with their foot structure. So they have hooves that actually almost work like suction cups. So if you can kind of imagine this as you press your hands together really tightly, and if you pull them apart, you might feel them sticking together a little bit, kind of working like a suction cup. Well, that's how our mountain goats hooves work. So they're able to climb up rock faces and cliffs that other animals cannot climb. So that's why they are built for the mountains. And we also have another animal that's really built for the mountains as well, and that's going to be our bighorn sheep. So those sheep that have the really big curled horns, that's going to be only in the males for a bighorn sheep. But those big curled horns are really important for their survival. They help them fight for mates as well as for territory. And then we cannot overlook my favorite animal here in Glacier National Park, the marmot. So marmots, they essentially look like big groundhogs and they also love to live up in the mountains. So they live up where those mountain goats, where those bighorn sheep live. And they are such a unique animal and my favorite animal because they actually are only awake and around for a few months out of the year. They tend to go in hibernation come September and they don't reemerge from hibernation until probably about May. So they're not awake very often, but when they are awake, they're out and about exploring the high country of the park. And if you're out exploring Glacier National Park, there's really one route that most people will take in the park, and that is going to be our going to the Sun Road. So you can see this road, the black line here that stretches from the western half of the park by Lake McDonald cuts across the mountains and then comes down to the eastern edge of the park over in the St. Mary area. And why so many people explore the park via this road has to do with the fact that it is an engineering marvel. It's amazing. This road was constructed right along the side of a mountain ledge. And this was built back in the 1920s, completed in the early 1930s. 30s. So back when there was not all of this advanced technology that we have today when we're doing road construction. So really incredible feat for this to get constructed. And if you were to drive this road, it's honestly a little bit scary. It's a very narrow road. It has some pretty big drop offs on either side, but it's definitely well worth it to take that trip across going to the sun because you get to see some incredible views. So you're the whole time you're on going to the Sun Road, you are going to be going along this garden wall, this incredible mountain range that we have right here. You can actually see that road cutting right across the garden wall. And that road will take you to a lot of really unique hikes and spots that you can get to here in the park. One of the more common hikes that people will do if they take going to the Sun Road, they'll get to the highest point on the road, which is Logan Pass. That is at 6,600 feet in elevation. And from that point, you can take a pretty short about two or so mile hike out to Hidden Lake. So this lake, you're hiking the whole way up these mountains and you honestly don't see this lake until probably about the last quarter of a mile of that hike. So it truly is hidden for most of the hike. So you can really explore and hike to a lot of incredible places across the park, especially just off that going to the Sun Road. And a lot of these unique features that you'll see across the park were actually sculpted out by glaciers. And glaciers are the namesake for Glacier National Park. 
the glaciers that sculpted out our landscape, they were here over 2 million years ago and they were massive sheets of ice, so big that you could actually barely see the tops of the mountains sticking out from those sheets of ice. Today we still have glaciers in the park. They are not those glaciers we had in the past carving out the landscape. They are instead what we call alpine glaciers. And that means that they sit high up in the mountains and they're still carving out the landscape, but at a much, much smaller scale. They're not carving out the valleys. They're just working away on individual mountains. And these glaciers we found over time are really greatly changing. So we have been doing, uh, in conjunction with the United States Geologic Survey, we have been looking to study these glaciers and we have been doing a repeat photography project. And that involves looking at historic photos of glaciers and comparing it to recent photos of glaciers to see how they're changing. And you can see this photo right here. This is one of the more popular glaciers in Glacier National Park because you can hike to this one. This is a series of glaciers we call Grinnell, Gem, and Salamander glaciers. So if you look at the photo on the left, that was from 1910. You can see that that whole area is just encompassed in a big sheet of glacial ice. If you look at the photo taken in 2012 from the exact same viewpoint, you can see that a lot of that glacial ice has disappeared. You look kind of in this region right here, you can see that the one ice mass here, they're completely two different ice masses now. So that's kind of where they've separated over time. You can also see that a glacial lake is starting to form under that ice as it starts to recede. Another really important glacier, especially on the western half of the park, is Sperry Glacier. It's kind of the headwaters for a lot of our waterways, like Lake McDonald itself. And Sperry Glacier is also shrinking over time. So we see back in 1913, you can see that Sperry Glacier covered a lot of that mountainside. And now if you look at the photo from 2008, there is a whole lot less glacial ice covering that mountainside. And a lot of this change that we're seeing in the glaciers can be attributed to climate change, especially anthropogenic climate change or human caused climate change. So really studying these glaciers and seeing how they're changing over time really is great evidence and great proof that we as humans are having an impact on the climate and we are co contributing to that climate change that is so greatly shaping the world. And then one last really unique thing about Glacier National Park is the fact that we are actually an international peace park. We are the world's first international peace park, in fact. That means that we work in conjunction with Parks Canada to protect land on both the U.S. side of the border as well as the Canadian side of the border. So we are connected into a greater park called Waterton Lakes and Glacier National Inter Glacier National Park, and we're an international peace park. So we're kind of combined with Waterton Lakes National Park. And with the two of that, with these two of these parks combined, it really creates an interesting land management challenge. So we work together to manage wildfires, to manage wildlife, to manage visitors. And this also creates a really unique opportunity for visitors who come to this place. Because when you come to Waterton Glacier International Peace Park, you have the opportunity to hike across that Canadian US border. You have the opportunity to even take a boat across that border on Waterton Lake. Waterton Lake stretches from the US all the way up into Canada. Of course, you do need to have a passport to do either of these methods of transportation to cross that border. But if you bring your passport with you, you really get a chance to explore lots of really unique land throughout these two different parks. And then within Waterton Lakes National Park, they have a really unique building, a really unique hotel. This right here is the Prince of Wales Hotel. And this structure really plays into a lot of the history of Glacier National Park and Waterton Lakes National Park. This was a hotel that was constructed back in the 1920s. It was constructed by the Great Northern Railway a rail line that had come out this way and actually really heavily promoted Glacier National Park as a destination for tourists to come to. So they built a series of elaborate hotels across Waterton, across Glacier National Park. And what's so cool about Prince of Wales is that when you are in, within Waterton Lakes, this is a very prominent thing that you will see because it sits up on a bluff looking right down at Waterton Lake. So really amazing building. 
We also have other historic hotels built within Glacier itself. This right here is Lake McDonald Lodge. Well, Lake McDonald Lodge was not built by the Great Northern Railway. It was built by a man by the name of John Lewis, a local resident of the area. It still actually kind of mimics the architectural style of the hotels built by the Great Northern Railway. They kind of have the Swiss influence because they were trying to promote a lot of wealthy United States residents who normally would go over to Switzerland, they're trying to promote for them to stay in the US and go to America's little Switzerland. And then last but not least, other unique historical elements that you can find in the park are some backcountry chalets. These were also built by the Great Northern Railway back in the early 1900s, and two of these still exist in the park to this day. So you can walk into the backcountry to these grand stone structures, and you're actually still able to stay at these chalets overnight. So it's unique that even over a hundred years later, you're still having a very similar experience in Glacier National Park as you would have if you were back here in the early 1900s. So I think that really these wide variety of natural and cultural resources, as well as all of the great nat natural and really unique wildlife resources that we have at this place make Glacier National Park so special and make it a place that's really valuable to continue to protect. I think at that's this point kind of wraps up our presentation and now we can open things up to questions. Very cool. Well, thank you so, so much, Stephanie. Um, and so yes, for anyone tuning in at home, we've already had a few people typing in questions. Just let me know where you're joining from. Type in questions in the chat bar. I'll take as many as we can. My first question is that cool hat you showed in that second last picture. Do you get to wear those sort of hats when you're out in the field? I hope so. Absolutely. So these are our ranger hats. We have a hat for the summer. We have a hat for the winter. So this is our summer hat. It tends to be a little more breathable. Um, so we do anytime that we're outdoors, we do wear these hats. It's just a big icon tells people, hey, you, I'm a ranger. I work here. Let me help you. Nice. Very cool. Actually, we'll keep on screen share for a second, but this first question from Sarah in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, they want to come to Glacier National Park in the summer. Hopefully that's a thing that they can do. And they want to know if you have a favorite trail. So in that map you showed earlier, maybe there's one we could identify, but a favorite trail, a place where you could escape the crowds at a popular, at the popular park in the summer. Absolutely. So it can be pretty tricky to escape the crowds. Probably one of the coolest trails I think in the park, but it tends to be very, very busy is our Grinnell Glacier Trail. And why it's so cool is not only is your end destination to getting to a glacier where you get to see that glacier. You don't get to go up and touch it, but you get to see it pretty close. You get to see the glacial lake, but you also get up into the high country of Glacier National Park. So you never know what wildlife you might run into and you get fantastic views all back in the many glacier valley. So that's definitely a highlight hike for most people. And it's one of my favorite hikes. I'd say if you are looking for a little more solitude, a little more quiet places to go in the park, uh, another valley that's really good to go explore. And let me see if I can find this one quickly. Oh, unfortunately it's not in that little clip art here, but if you look down and see where St. Mary Lake is, there's another valley south of St. Mary. And that is called Two Medicine. Two Medicine tends to be a little bit quieter because it's off the going to the sun road. And that area also has a lot of really cool trails. So that would be a good place to check out as well. Very cool. Well, now if you want to come out of screen share, it'd be great to Absolutely. see you again. I, we love the background, by the way, with that beautiful picture. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, you highlighted a lot of wildlife there. And so the other day we had a wolverine researcher that talked about wolverines in that part of the world. Do you guys have them in the park? Have you seen them in the park? Anything interesting about them? Yeah, so we do have wolverines here in Glacier National Park. Um, they're very rare to see. I've worked here for five years and I have never seen a wolverine. Some of my coworkers have gotten very lucky, just happened to be in the right place at the right time and saw a wolverine way off in the distance on a snowbank climbing a mountain. Um, exactly, they had their binoculars out and they're like, I guess that's a wolverine. Um, so we do have them here. They're just a very elusive animal. Don't see that often. Yeah, uh, the researcher that we had had spent her entire life studying them and had seen two live in the wild, like directly as opposed to in traps or, or tracked them, but only two. They're really, really hard to spot. Holy cow, absolutely. <laughs> All right, we get this question for you every time. Do you have a favorite part of your job? Oh, favorite part of my job. <laughs> I uh, Let's see. There's so many good parts to it. I'd say one of my favorite parts is that for most 
most of the time when I'm working in the park, I get to be outside for most of the day. Another really cool part is that I get to interact with people all from all across the country, from all across the world and help them have a really cool experience in Glacier National Park. Whether that be telling them a little bit more about the rocks or the animals or really giving someone a good recommendation on a hike that they get to do, just really being able to be a part of someone's vacation and really make their time in Glacier National Park special, I think is a really fun part of my job. Fantastic. Well, your enthusiasm certainly shines through even from home. So there you go. <laughs> um, Stephanie, how does someone get your job? I mean, if people are at home thinking, man, this looks like a great gig. You get to talk about some really cool places, highlight uh, you know, an amazing part of the U.S. and show people around. How, what's your story to end up in this role as a ranger? Yes. So my story started out, my parents um, used to take us, my sister and I, to a lot of national parks. We actually grew up really close to Cuyahoga Valley National Park in Ohio. So we spent a lot of time there. And then when I was in middle school, my parents took us out west, out to Yellowstone, to Grand Tetons, this whole Western trip. And every year after that, we kept going to different national parks and different national parks all the way up until we were in college. And all these trips out west, these different national parks made me realize, hey, that's a job I can do. I love being outside. And knowing that, I went into college and I studied geology for my undergrad, and then I studied environment and natural resources for my master's, knowing that I wanted to work as a ranger. And then I also took a few internships. So it's hard to get your foot in the door with the park service. There's a lot of people wanting these jobs and there's not a whole lot of jobs. So really doing an internship or volunteering is a great way to get your foot in the door, get your name out to people around you. So then when you apply to jobs, people already know you and it's a little bit easier to get in. Fantastic. Thanks for the awesome advice. All right, uh, Sarah, again, Ann Arbor, we got a few more questions from her and I love her questions. So are any of the glaciers still advancing or are they all in retreat? Oh, that's a good question. So right now we have about 26 named glaciers in the park. Everything else is kind of not the big or the right size to be a glacier, essentially. You have to be at least 25 acres in size. So imagine 25 football fields put together, at least 100 feet deep, so pretty thick. And then it has to be moving because glaciers are an erosive force. They need to be moving to do that erosion. So here in the park with our 26 glaciers, we find that all of them are shrinking. They're all shrinking at different rates. Some are shrinking very quickly. Others are shrinking very slowly, but none of them so far in all of the data we've collected has shown that any are getting bigger or even remaining the same. They all tend to be shrinking just at different rates. Yeah, and you mentioned partnering with the USGS, and this is something that we're seeing from uh, you know, services all around the world measuring glaciers. There are a few in Antarctica that are growing, uh, which is interesting, and we're you know that that research is publicly accessible online. But in the vast majority of cases, ice sheets are, are declining or entirely melting uh, in the last few years. That's something obviously we want to keep track of, and and we really appreciate it being part of the presentation today. Mm -hmm. All right. Sarah wants to know, how do visitors get to hike or boat to the international border? Is that from the glacier side or the Waterton side? How do you even get there? <laughs> Ooh, so the easiest way to do both of those things is to drive into Canada and enter from Waterton Lakes. Once you get into Waterton Lakes, that's actually where you'll pick up the boats. So you'll catch the boat in Waterton and you can ride it down to the end of Waterton Lake into the US. Um, to hike, it's honestly easiest, shorter trails if you start in Waterton and hike down. Even the shortest trail to go from the Waterton town site down to the point where you could catch the boat again in the U.S. is I think it's about nine or ten miles one way. So it's a pretty long hike. If you start from the U.S., you're looking at, I'm trying to think if you start in an area in the park, over probably about 20 miles just to get to the border to get that boat. Um, so it's definitely, it's tricky to get it from the U.S. Waterton's a lot easier. Yeah, I mean, if you want to do a marathon before you catch the boat, the boat will seem that much sweeter when you get there, but might not be the best. Up for everybody. <laughs> yep. Uh, all right. Um, what resources can people find? So if you, I mean, whether it's with regards to the National Park Service in general, Glacier National Park, glaciers, uh, anything that really inspired you and excites you that we can share with people tuning in today? Um, I would say the NPS.gov website is really great. Um, there's lots of different parks right now. We're all trying really hard to get a lot more digital resources available and online since all of our operations have really switched to more digital interaction just to make sure everyone's staying safe across the country. 
So definitely the nps.gov website is really great. You can explore by state. So if you're living in the United States, you can explore by state to see what national parks are near you. And then if you click on different national parks, their web pages have lots of different resources to look at, to learn more about those parks. Um, our Glacier National Park website has a lot of really great information, uh, especially if any kids are at home, we have lots of great lesson plans online that you can utilize to learn a little bit more, really have some fun activities to do. So definitely the mps.gov website is probably one of the best ones available. Nice. I've already linked that into the YouTube chat bar. I will Perfect. link your National Park one there as well. And check out their Twitter page. I mean, some really, really great social media interactions happening, highlighting some beautiful pictures, resources, and more. So I really encourage you to check that out. All right, we're going to take two more questions before we wrap up, Stephanie. It just flies by, doesn't it? It does. Um, so for glaciers, I mean, this is one of the rare places in the, in the world, and certainly in North America, where you can go and see glaciers live. Where did glaciers used to extend to? So like 20,000 years ago, can you give a sense of how big these were in, in the North American continent? So our glaciers that were here back um, 2 million years ago, when you, when you look at a map of the US, um, a lot of times you can see that it'll kind of dip down into the Great Lakes area because a lot of glaciers really shaped out states like Ohio, I think Illinois, uh, Wisconsin, around those Great Lakes area because glaciers carved those out. So you can see that glaciers kind of carved down into those states. And in other maps that I've seen, it carves down a little bit into those mo most northernmost states in the US. But like those big, big glaciers that uh, back at least two million years ago, they didn't really extend super far south in the country. Over periods of time in the past, there definitely have been little ice ages and different changes in the climate where definitely glaciers could have popped up elsewhere, but those ones that really played an impact here in the park, they honestly in those maps didn't dip super far down into the US. Fascinating. There you go. I guess I'm, I'm Toronto and Ontario biased being here and thinking of, you know, mile high glaciers not too, too long ago, but there you go. Thank you for the, the yeah. clarification. All right, uh, we'll take one last question again from Sarah. Thank you so much for joining in, Sarah. We really appreciate all these great questions. So she wanted to ask, having spent five years there, what is your favorite experience you've had in Glacier National Park? Oh, my favorite Ooh. experience. Oh, <laughs> that's so hard. Um, there's been so many cool experiences where I've run into just really unique wildlife that I've gotten to see. Um, I would probably say my some of my favorite experiences I've had in the park have just been whenever my families come to visit. Um, because I get used to living and working here, I get used to seeing the same things every day. So it kind of becomes commonplace, almost like if I was back home with my parents in Ohio, the neighborhood is commonplace. But getting to see this place through my visitors eyes, my parents and my sister has always been a really cool experience. Um, and every year my sister and I go on a backpacking trip in the park every time she visits. And that's probably one of my favorite things to get to explore something so beautiful and get to explore it with one of my favorite people. What a heartening and lovely story. And I could not think of a better way to wrap up the session. So Stephanie, thank you so, so much for taking us on a virtual tour of this amazing place that you get to, to live and work. And uh, we really, really appreciate it today. Of course, it was great to talk to you all. Awesome. For everyone tuning in at home, thank you so much for tuning in. Again, over 100 programs in April alone featuring explorers, scientists, and amazing places from around the globe. So keep tuning in. We really appreciate you joining us. And for now, everyone, have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye for now. Bye, Stephanie. <laughs>